So this morning, a friend of mine sent me an email um, with it was a link to a BBC article on a reinterpretation of a fossil called Nectocaris. Um, you might notice I have the uh, screen uh, picture in picture thing. I'm hoping this is going to work out. I'll be doing it throughout this video. Um, I, well, I'll see how it works. It's an experiment, so forgive any uh, technical difficulties. So, now this Nectocaris was, for, was one of the Burgess Shale fauna, and it has traditionally been interpreted to be an arthropod-like animal, uh, you know, jointed leg, insects, spiders, crabs, and their kin. Um, but one of a group of arthropods known from the Burgess Shales are called the anomala carriage. Lobopods is, is a better term for them. And this was in, interpreted to be one of the lobopods. And this new interpretation uh, makes the claim that they are, in fact, the ancestor of the squid um, and reinterprets their structures to be ancestral structures that we see now in modern cephalopods. Now, when I first read the BBC article on, on the reinterpretation of this find, I found several problems, uh, things that didn't make sense based on what I know about um, theories of cephalopod evolution, about invertebrate zoology in general. Uh, but I believed that those flaws, I believed that that I was that they were probably things like typical pop science reporting where they get fundamental aspects wrong or they oversimplify something or they make a grand sweeping statement. That's not the intention of the original author. So I went to uh, the online online version of, of the journal Nature, which I have access to through my university account. Um, and got the original article itself to read what the, the you know what it said, um, and I was a little bit appalled to find out that the BBC article got pretty much everything right. Uh, now there were a few oversweeping statements that you come to expect. For example, just calling it the the ancestor of the squid, um, when the authors really talk about it being. Um, potential relative of the ancestor, you know, essentially saying it's resembling or close to the ancestor of the squid as opposed to being the ancestor of the squid like the BBC article states. Um, the BBC article also has an interview with one of the authors where they make the statement, the author makes the claim that this puts cephalopod evolution back at the beginning of the Cambrian explosion um, and implies that complex life suddenly appears overnight and I'm just waiting for creationists to get a hold of that and um, and misinterpret completely mess I mean it was it was kind of an irresponsible thing for him to say um, it, whatever so now uh, I want to get into this a bit and I want to uh, I, I don't want to go into all of the details about what I had a problem with because it's invert zo stuff it's really some heavy invert zo stuff but I want to talk about just a few um, of the problems. Now, I'm first going to kind of summarize the paper. Uh, this might take more than one part. I apologize if it does. Um, so the authors of this paper, now this, this fossil, Nectocaris, again, as I mentioned, was, was thought to be a lobopod or arthropod type organism. Uh, and then it was, this reinterpretation basically puts it as a two-legged squid squid with two arms, no other tentacles, two arms, but essentially a squid-like body with fins on the side, um, with uh, eyes on stalks, um, a mouth in between the tentacles, and most importantly, the authors find, a funnel um, called a siphuncal or a funnel in modern squids. That's the tube by which they can squirt water out. Um, the authors found that this was a flexible tube that they could squirt water in all directions, so it was very much like modern squids in that it could um, move forward and backwards by jetting water. That's that's the interpretation of what the authors make. So, based upon this, um, now traditional cephalopod uh, phylogeny has basically, okay, it's kind of complex, but essentially cephalopods derived from a limpet-like, you know, a limpet like a cap-like shell, a limpet-like thing that sat on the bottom. Um, there's a group of them. Uh, that had a structure that's been called the siphuncal or been called homologous to the siphuncal. Um, these are extinct now, but they're very, very early Cambrian. Uh, and they derived that this, as a benthic predator, uh, eventually became, had a shell that could, that could lift off the bottom, eventually becoming a, um, a nectic swimming predator. Um, and the shell, the siphuncal, uh, became a gas-filled organ for, for flotation. 
Um, and this is supported by a lot of fossil evidence. This is also there's there's we don't have obviously don't have genes from those things, but it's it's supported within the framework of mollusk taxonomy through genetics. It's supported very well. It basically puts octopus. Um, Gastropods, and then derived from a gastropod-like thing, monoplacophorans, uh, these cephalopods, and also another group called scaphopods. So it, it, it fits together with the fossils very, very well. This new finding is very revolutionary if it's true. But again, I'm going to tell you why I don't think it's true. So, uh, okay, let me see. I don't, don't want to get, get ahead of myself here. Okay, so essentially... These authors are saying that early on in mollusk evolution, the squid body appeared. Um, Precambrian, probably, the squid body appeared, and then subsequently diversified and evolved into the modern mollusk body types. Okay, so they're saying um, a very, very different pattern. And in fact, the authors are claiming that the shell that's become such a typical thing of, you know, clams, mussels, uh, extinct cephalopods, modern nautiloids, um, chitons, that kind of thing, evolved separately in each of the major classes. That's the, an interpretation they make. Now they show this cladogram um, wherein you can see that there's at least minimally seven different events in mollusk history where the shell would have to independently evolve. Uh, now I see a big problem with that. Big big problem with it um, based on the l rules of parsimony. Um, one of them being the fact that the mollusk shell is a very complex structure. Um, its microstructure, the way it's laid down um, has been very adequately explained in the same fashion that another group of non-shell things secrete spicules into their into a, an integument. Um, anyway, the, um, again, I don't want to bore the details, but the point is, is that mollusks pretty much all secrete their shell in pretty much the same way with a general pattern. This would say that that pattern independently evolved and it's simply either a phylogenetic constraint or a complete coincidence that it's the same type of deposition of the shell in all of these groups of mollusks. That seems highly unlikely. Um, the biggest problem I have with this uh, the cladogram that the authors have constructed, however, is that the cladogram, if you notice it, okay, it has their extinct, the extinct nectar, nectocaris, um, and it's got the aplacophorans, the monoplacophorans, polyplacophorans, cephalopods, gastropods, um, and bivalves. Um, essentially, it has the modern classes of mollusks put into a framework with this extinct nectocaris. Uh, now, that would all be fine and good if modern classes of, of mollusks were all that ever existed. In other words, if today's diversity of mollusks represents the diversity of everything that there ever has been. And that's simply a bunch of bullshit, okay? Um, there are extinct classes. There's rostroconchs and a number of other mollusk relatives, if they're, not, if they're not classes of mollusks, close relatives of mollusks, that are now extinct. Um... All of them shell bearing, by the way. I think that's that's that needs to be said. Um, okay, so there's all of these groups of mollusks that are extinct, um, and within modern taxa, there's a diversity of forms, meaning we only have a small fraction of the diversity of gastropods that have ever lived. We have a small fraction of the diversity of monoplacophorans. Um, these were once groups during the Paleozoic that had an enormous amount of body plans and diversity that's gone. None of that's taken into account in the framework of, into this cladistic analysis that the authors do here. These authors did not take into account um, the extinct groups of mollusks, and including this group, uh, these Helionesids, um, probably pronouncing that wrong, uh, which were a group of monoplacophorans uh, within which the cephalopods probably are, probably are derived. And, and um, they also did what they didn't take into account, and this is ignoring the cladogram, is the fact that the earliest definite cephalopod, the earliest absolute cephalopod we have, is a nautiloid from the late Cambrian. Um, and this nautiloid was a benthic predator. Okay, so this fit. Now this fits with traditional cephalopod phylogeny. Does not fit with this new interpretation because, as a benthic pred predator, its shell was was not gas filled. It was too heavy to enable it to swim around. Okay, It could not swim with this shell. 
Um, it probably crawled around on the bottom, used its tentacles as grasping things to capture prey. Now this, you 